Okay, let's go ahead and, and uh, go to the Lord. Father, I want to thank you so much for this week. And in the midst of the, the heat, Lord, uh, yeah, give us places to be cool and you provide for us, Lord. And um, you're always there. We, we know your hand is always upon our lives. There's never a moment that you're not watching over us, whether we're going through trials and um, or we're, we're going through good times, Lord, you're always there. And so I thank you for the good times and the bad times, Lord, know, Lord knowing that you're there. I thank you for uh, all the folks in this class, ask you to bless their lives in a special way, Lord. I thank you last week for bringing Everett to church. It was so good to see him again. And I pray for uh, my brother Herman, Lord, that, that uh, he's able to do a little bit better Lord, I lift up to you um, other folks that aren't doing all that well. And I pray for Chuck Sappington, Lord, and the surgery he's having on the 23rd, that you bless him. I, I ask you for a special blessing on that young man that, that pulled over and helped Verla on the freeway, Lord, and all the things he did to assure that she could get home safe. A special blessing on him, Lord. I pray for 17-year-old uh, Travis, Lord, that, that – uh, the problem that he's been having with epilepsy for years and years, that the treatment that he's having right now will alleviate that, Lord, and so that he can get on with a, a normal life as best he can, Lord. I pray your hand be on his life. Lift up to you, Alan Lisa, Lord, in and out of the hospital last week. I pray for Alan for a healing, Lord, and a comfort, and I pray for Lisa, Lord, that uh, her stress level would, uh, that, well, you just comfort her, Lord. I lift up to you, Carol, and it's uh, going to travel her and Mike this week to, to uh, their new place, Lord. And I pray that when she does get up there for good, Lord, that you bless her with, uh, with uh, the capacity to breathe really well and that um, uh, just that you bless her, Lord. Bless them. Lift up to you, my um, uh, Bob Hammond, Lord, that you bless him with a healing in his life and uh, Lord, that your hand be upon him. I lift up to you, Debbie's, uh, in, in the biopsy that she's expecting to come back, Lord, that it would be, um, it would have good report for her, Lord. And then, Lord, I, I pray for this lesson because as we read about your return, Lord, we know that it's not just something we're reading, it's something that's going to happen and that one day you'll return for your church. Lord, uh, the world will um, be transformed eventually into what you designed it to be in the first place before sin ever entered in. So we give you this time, Lord. We ask you to bless us and fill us with your Holy Spirit and teach us through this lesson in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're in the study of the book of Revelation, as you know. We began our study back in, in the beginning of February, okay? So it's been a while. So we're in our sixth month, maybe over three-fourths of it. And this is the final book in the series of 66 books of the Bible, as you know. In 216 chapters in the New Testament, um, the return of Christ is spoken of over 300 times. So this isn't something that you can just say, um, oh, it's, uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's, they're saying this because it means something else. No, it, it's, it's a concrete thing that's happening. And it's hard to just study Revelation by yourself. As you know, you can read it by yourself. That's fine. And I hope you do. Uh, but um, it's easy to become lost and frustrated. For an example, most of what we know about the Antichrist is found in the book of Daniel. That's why we went over two weeks of study in that. And that really didn't even focus exactly on, on the Antichrist. Most of what we know about the millennial reign of Christ is found in Isaiah and Ezekiel and Revelation. I mean, not Revelation. So those two books are what we know about the millennial. So uh, studying this book requires examining numerous passages in the Old and New Testament. Um, Revelation 1.3 says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. So blessed are those who read, who hear, and heed. So we want to pay attention to the things that we read about. In the next two chapters, the victory over Christ's enemies will be complete as it was typified back in the book of Exodus. And I, I love that picture, so I wanted to put it in, but that, that, that to me, you remember when Moses stood with his back to his enemies with the great Red Sea in front of him, and, uh, and he said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And, and that ground opened up and it was dry. I mean, that's, that's, that's important. It's not just a went away. It was dry. 
Moses not only prophesied the Israelites' escape from Egyptians, but also their total deliverance from them forever. For the Egyptians who you have seen today, you will see no more forever. I love the way that's said, no more, you'll see them no more forever. <laughs> it's kind of strange the way it's said, but it's good. And our enemy, death and sin, we will also see no more forever. So in the book of Revelation, we see the, the uh, these are two charts. One of them is, uh, I, I like them both, but um, in the book of Revelation, we see the cons consummation, I put consumption, boy, that's wrong. The consummation of what first began in the book of Genesis. And you see some of these things, marriage. Uh, all right, surely, all right. Hello, hello. Good to see you girls. Hello, Shirley. Glad to see you. We're just still going over last week, so uh, so you're right on time here. So, so in the book of Revelation, we see the consummation of what first began in the book of Genesis. And you see some of these things on the chart. Marriage of the first Adam, marriage of the last Adam. Uh, the serpent was loose, the serpent was bound. Sorrow and death was introduced and sorrow and death will be removed. The way of the tree of life was closed off and, and uh, the way of the tree of life will be opened in Revelation. Natural heavens and earth and the spiritual heavens and earth. And then that other one, the first heaven and earth, the new heaven and the earth, the first garden, the tree of life guarded, the garden city and the tree of life available. Um, again, the first marriage and the last marriage as the marriage of the lamb to the church. Satan tempts Eve to sin. Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. Death enters the scene. There's no more death. Babylon was built, and we're going to see Babylon destroyed. The Redeemer was promised, and the Redeemer reigns. So you see what, be, you know, 315, the seed of woman will come, you know, and, and, and she'll be in enmity with the seed of Satan. And then throughout the whole scriptures, then we get to the birth of Christ. It took us 65 books and thousands of years to understand the trauma and pollution of what sin can do. Um, if God would have just taken care of sin completely in the garden when it happened, uh, man would never have understood the implications of sin's devastating effects. It, it took us to see that. If you think in your life, just your lifetime, how much sin has been perverted, how expanded the things, I never saw that stuff happen. Even when I was a kid, this, it happened that much in our lifetime. And then you take that back thousands of years and it went piece by piece to the point where, where we're crying for the Lord to come back because something's got to happen. The world will become like the days of Noah, where every thought and intent was evil in mankind. And so the Lord will come back. So when you see his judgment, when he comes back, and it sounds like it's fierce and ferocious, it is because these people would not have turned to God no matter what. And so they're going to be gone. Um, in chapter 17 and 18, um, and we're going to be in chapter 18 this week. In chapter uh, 17 and 18, it deals with the fall of Babylon. Last week in chapter 17, we read about the fall of spiritual Babylon which encompasses all the false isms and religions of the world. They all had their origin in Babylon. The very first uh, false religion was in Babylon when Nimrod set up the Tower of Babel and wanted to go to the heavens and, and uh, so that we can make a name for ourselves. He disobeyed God and they created a false religion. It was birthed there in Babylon and he led his people that way. God scrambled their languages, resulting in the people spreading throughout the world um, but unfortunately, they brought the seeds of idolatry with them. So everywhere they went, they not only knew maybe one thing, but they also knew what they practiced in Babylon. So they carried them with them. That's why we see things throughout the world. We will see the fall of Babylon in this week's lesson. However, while Babylon is, a, is uh, an ancient ruin in our world today, in the tribulation, the city will have been re resurrected to its former glory. She will once again be at the seat of a world power. And in chapter 17 and 18, we see two different aspects of Babylon. Um, not, not two Babylons, just two aspects. You get in chapter 17, you see a spiritual Babylon. And she was identified with the harlot that sits on many waters, indicating that her influence was upon the whole world. So when you hear harlot, think false religious systems that take away from the, the true husband, you might say. Lord. We're told that this great harlot will seduce kings, the kings of the earth, and make them drunk with her immorality. That means uh, 
when a person gets drunk, they have no sense of where they're going. They just follow anything because their minds are scrambled and she will make them drunk with her immorality. They will follow her anywhere because of this. Re Revelation 17, five calls the Babel Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. That means that Babylon is the source of all false religious systems that have spread throughout the world. Whenever you see something, anything from like a false religion, like a, a Hinduism or Buddhism or Muslims to just something that might be in our Mormonism, uh, 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 Jehovah Witnesses, something like this, they all had their seeds in Babylon because they distort the truth. So um, she is seductive because she offers people what they want to hear and pleasures that they desire. And you can see this in a lot of big churches. They will uh, offer you a sermon that doesn't talk about judgment or sin. They will just, it, it makes you feel good or that you can have anything you want if you just believe in it. That, and people will run after that. Um, so we kind of get the flavor of the entity here that is being judged, this false system. And when John saw this woman with the gold cup abominations and immorality, and when he saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the witnesses, the scripture says he wondered greatly. And an angel told John that he would tell John the mystery of the woman and the beast who carries her. The beast that the woman or the harlot was riding on had ten heads, uh, seven heads. Okay, and this I know it was a little bit complicated last week. Uh, the, the, the beast that the woman was riding on had seven heads and ten horns with seven diadems, which are ruling crowns on its seven heads. Um, this goes back to the reference in Revelations 12, three speaking of the great dragon, which is Satan. The seven heads are seven world powers or empires that would reign both over Babylon and Jerusalem. And it began with the reign of Nebuchadnezzar who first defeated it and ruled over Jerusalem. And just as Nebuchadnezzar's dream began with one world leader to, be, to begin the time of the Gentiles, it, you got to understand that out of all these empires, Nebuchadnezzar was over everything. Get the Medes and Pers and Persians, and they have two different rulers. In Alexander's time, he was rulers, then it split into four. Rome had a series of different uh, Caesars and all, but only Nebuchadnezzar was a world leader over all of the, the, the times there. And so also the, the times of the Gentiles will end with one world leader, which is the Antichrist. And um, he will bring the end of the times of the Gentiles. So um, I, I had this, uh, this picture up here to kind of give you an idea because it talks about, it says seven heads, and see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, the angel here explains that seven heads or seven mountains and seven kings um, on which the woman, spiritual Babylon, sits. Uh, the angel tells John that five of these kings or mountains have fallen. One king is and the other has not yet come. But when he comes, he must remain a little while. So what he's talking about, he's talking about five world empires that have come. And when John's writing this letter, one exists right now. That means six. And he says one will come. And we're talking about the one that comes. We're talking about that one world empire that will come in the end where one man will be over everything, which is the Antichrist. In Revelation 17, 11, the beast, which was and is not, is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven and goes to destruction. And that sounds like a bunch of what? What are you saying? It says that the beast, okay, the Antichrist, was and is not. And he will also be an eighth. And what this talks about is, is we, we read earlier that when, when Antichrist comes, uh, he's going gonna, gonna, he's gonna to die of a fatal head wound. But then he's going to come back to life. And the world's going to wonder about this. And they're all going to follow after the beast. They're going to worship, worship Satan or the dragon. So when it says he was and is not, it means he was there. And he is not. He died. And he himself is also the eighth. So he was the seventh world ruler, and he's also going to be the eighth world ruler because he died and come back, okay? And I don't, that's a little tough, especially if you just entered the class today. So, um, okay. Okay, then here's another chart. This chart gives you an approximate timing on how I see these bowls being poured out and how the closer to Christ's return, the more violent the action on earth will be. Again, I urge you to check out this um, 
uh, do your own research because I can make mistakes. Um, and but you see how these these uh, these chapters kind of spread and then they intensify towards the end here. And we're going to be in chapter 18, which in which this army invades this week. But up to this point, the end of spiritual Babylon, the hail, all these things are happening to the point where um, it's intensifying. So you can see how that, like I said, the hail, state, hail, storms and earthquakes from chapter 16 and the end of spiritual Babylon in chapter 17 just slightly precede the destruction of physical Babylon while the Antichrist and his army are positioning themselves to invade Jerusalem. Okay. So Antichrist and his enemies have, have or and his and armies have left Babylon. They're heading towards Jerusalem. And so we'll begin this week's lesson. <laughs> After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined, illumined with his glory. And he cried out, with a mighty voice saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. Uh, for all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. So the theme of Babylon is Babylon's downfall is continued, but it's now presented as a city of commerce. It's where business takes place. Okay, so um, you see uh, men from all nations are drawn to this city where they can uh, bring their merchandise and do business. Now, while most of chapter 17 speaks of Babylon, the religious system, the end of chapter 17 and all of 18 speaks of Babylon, the city itself. So first of all, we see another angel with great authority announcing that Bob Babylon has fallen, fallen. Remember in the scriptures, whenever you hear something repeated twice, it's emphasizing that it's going to happen. A double repetition means it's a done deal. It's fallen, fallen. It's already happened. Just like in Daniel chapter five, when uh, you've been weighing the balance and found wanting, you know, you're going to be gone this, year, this night. So these verses, <clears throat> these verses tell us of an economic collapse that will make the stock market crash of 1929 seem like nothing. OK, this economic disaster will be worldwide in its scope and will take away mankind's favorite God, which is money. And the prophets wrote about this period of time. They said, now, behold, here comes a troop of riders, horsemen in pairs. And one said, fallen, fallen is Babylon and all the images of her gods are shattered on the ground. Jeremiah wrote, suddenly Babylon has fallen and has been broken. Wail over her. Bring bomb for her pain. And you see the size of, of Babylon, and suddenly it has fallen. I mean, it's an, it's an intense act. These concerning the fall of Babylon are scattered throughout the prophets. And these are just two of many. Uh, look at the similarities between these two prophets who were 100 years apart. Um, Isaiah said, and Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans, which is Babylon, Chaldeans' pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, and Jeremiah says, as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah with its neighbors. And then in Isaiah 13, 20, I will, it will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation, nor will the Arab pitch his tent there, nor will the shepherds make their flocks lie down there. And Jeremiah says, no man will live there, nor will any son of man reside in it. And People are still living in Babylon today, okay? Uh, it's outskirts and some coming in and out, but it, is never, uh, it has never experienced this kind of devastation uh, as what we will see um, when the Lord judges it. So these are similarities between two prophets. Like I said, they're 100 years apart, uh, you know, and so, but they say the same thing. And they, they compare it with Sodom and Gomorrah. And when they compare it with Sodom and Gomorrah, it goes in your mind right away. Lot and his family gets out and fire and brimstone is completely devastated. Today, can you go into the town of Sodom and Gomorrah? No, they don't really even know where it's, it's been so devastated. They think that they might know, but no one's ever been there. So when you hear this, you think of that kind of, um, of impact. And then I highlighted that part underneath, fallen and fallen is Babylon the Great. She has become a dwelling place of demons 
a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. So when you hear it, it never be populated again. And then you see it has become a dwelling place for demons and every unclean spirit and every unclean and hateful bird. You get the idea that the only thing that dwells there is demonic spirits. OK, uh, so the angel speaks of her destruction and what she's turned into. Uh, Notice first that the angel tells us the spirit behind the system. It's a place of demons and unclean spirits. Uh, it is a system vile and corrupt in a world that has literally gone to the devil. Okay. Again, uh, scriptures here that, that back that. Isaiah says, but the desert creatures will lie down there and their, their houses will be full of owls, ostriches also will live there, and shaggy goats will frolic there. Hyenas will howl in their fortified towers, and jackals in their luxurious palaces. Her fateful time will also soon come, and her days will not be prolonged. And Jeremiah writes, therefore the desert creatures will live there, along with the jackals and the ostriches also uh, will live in it, and there will never again be inhabited or dwelt in the from generation to generation. So this this reference to scavenger birds is a way of saying that the only that only dead things will dwell in this place. Okay, they speak of only animals that will inhabit this land afterwards as being those who are scavengers and feed off dead fish. But I believe that these animals are even possessed, just like the the um, the, uh, the pigs at, at Gadara went over the cliff. I believe that's the the, the atmosphere which you see in here. Revelation 18.3, for all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. So you see um, three different types of people there, the nations, the kings, and the merchants are spoken of. Every area and people group were polluted by this system and her religious system. The nations are speaking of the human family, but more specific, the Gentile nations. The rulers or kings are those who rule specific areas of the earth or the, or the horns with the 10 diadems on them is spoken of in Revelations 13, 1 to 2. Um, the merchants were those who made profit from being associated with Babylon. You know, she's vile and corrupt and I can buy right into that because I'm making a lot of money off of her, you see. All of these were influenced by her and they engaged in sexual immorality with her. They associated with her to get ahead by doing so. They were united with the beast and Babylon. In Revelations 18, four and five, I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. It's not like God ever forgot the things that she's doing, but people think that God forgot. You know, he says, I've remembered her. I've seen what she's been doing and her cup is full now and I'm going to judge her just like he did with the Amorites back in Genesis. Before uh, this just people to come out of her, um, the voice of heaven speaks to those who have become believers during the tribulation and they haven't been uh, martyred yet. Maybe they still will be, but they're living in that area. The Jews still living in Babylon, and any who haven't taken the mark of the beast will flee the city in response to God's warning. God's warning to leave Babylon is similar to the one that Christ gave believers concerning Jer Jerusalem in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 25. And we see, this, um, we see this pattern repeated in Scripture about the warning before the judgment comes. You know, um, Noah. He preached for 120 years, and you better believe he was warning them. You see, uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah, he had the angel come in to pull out the remnant before God's destruction came. And we see this over and over again. Um, before God enacts his judgment, he protects his own. And here's some, a few scriptures. In Isaiah 48, 20, he says, Go forth from Babylon, flee from the Chaldeans, declare with the sound of joyful shouting, proclaim this, Send it out to the end of the earth, say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. Isaiah 52, 11, depart, depart, go out from her, touch nothing unclean, go out from the midst of her, purify yourselves, you who carry the vessels of the Lord. And remember, it just says this is going to be a habitation of every demon and unclean thing. He says, go, touch nothing unclean. Jeremiah writes, wander away from the midst of Babylon and go forth from the land of the Chaldeans. 
be also like male goats at the head of a flock. Another lead people with you. God's people in Babylon had been warned before this day through the prophets Isaiah and, and Jeremiah, and there's other prophets too. Um, their words were not uh, speaking of a time when Babylon would fall to the Medo-Persian Empire. You know, when we saw that statue, we saw Babylon, Medo-Persian, Greece, and Rome. Okay, it's not going to be the time when Medo-Persia conquered Babylon because they speak of, of um, different situations. When the Medo-Persian Empire conquered Babylon, it was by surprise and they didn't destroy the city. Okay, and the Jewish people were not killed, but embraced by Cyrus um, uh, of God because of God's prophetic word that was spoken to Cyrus through Daniel. So, or, or through Isaiah, I mean. So when, when Cyrus conquered, mo most of the people didn't even know it was conquered by the time they were already in there because it was by surprise. We're talking about a time when Babylon is devastated. So these prophecies have their fulfillment in the future, okay? Again, I have to go to the Old Testament because that's the only way you can look at some of these passages. Jeremiah, and we're going to hit Jeremiah and Zechariah this time. Jeremiah 51, 6 says, flee from the midst of Babylon, and each of you save his life. Do not be destroyed in her punishment, for this is the Lord's time of vengeance. He is going to render recompense to her. The time of his vengeance is the time when he comes back to destroy, okay? Jeremiah 51, 7, Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord, intoxicating all the earth. The nations have drunk of her wine, therefore the nations are going mad. So they're so caught up in any kind of worship, they're just mad. They're absolutely insane. I'll run after anything that looks good. Zechariah 2, 6, ho there, flee from the land of the north, declares uh, the Lord, for I have dispersed you as the four winds of heaven declares the earth, and ho Zion. Escape you who are living with the daughter of Babylon. So here are more words of, to those in Babylon from Jeremiah and also the prophet Zechariah. Also, their time was quite a bit different. Zechariah prophesied when the, the, um, the people of Israel that were in ba uh, Babylon returned and they built the temple. That's when Zechariah preached. Jeremiah preached years after that. There was a different temple standing by, um, it was Zerubbabel's, but Herod had made it bigger. And he's preaching during that time before Babylon destroys the city. Okay, so here are more words uh, like, okay, Zechariah calls Babylon the land of the north um, because uh, in those days, um, okay, so in those days, Babylon didn't just go over here so they'd be like the land of the east. They had to go up, they had to avoid this desert area, so they had to go up and then down. So when they came down, they were coming from the north. They, so that's why they say, um, beware, escape, you know, uh, flee from the land of the north. Okay. <clears throat> Revelations 18, 6 and 7. Pay her back even as she has paid and give her back, give back to her double according to her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, mix twice as much for her. To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously to the same degree give her torment and mourn for she says in her heart i sit as a queen and i am not a widow and would never see mourning she's, she's very arrogant and prideful for this reason in one day her plagues will come pestilence and mourning and famine and she will be burned up with fire for the lord god who judges her is strong so throughout the scriptures we read of God's justice in retribution. In Genesis 6, 6, 13, uh, when God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I'm about to destroy the whole earth. Because the earth was filled with violence, there was no more room for any good at all, he was going to destroy it. In Psalms 137, 8, O daughter of Babylon, you devastated one. How blessed will be the one who repays you with the recompense with which you have repaid us. In Jeremiah 51, 56, for the destroyer is coming against her, against Babylon, and her mighty men will be captured. Their bows are shattered, for the Lord is the God of recompense, and he will repay, he will fully repay. So um, the, the uh, accumulation of sin is so great, it has reached up to heaven. It's not like God never saw it, but it's to the point, no more, no more. In last week's lesson, we read about um, spiritual Babylon having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and unclean things uh, 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 of her immorality. And God saw a woman that was drunk with the blood of saints and with the blood of witnesses of Jesus. 
So you see in her immorality, and as a result of that immorality, it involves destroying those who believe in the true God. It doesn't matter how, and you can picture things in your mind. The Inquisition, I was reading, uh, uh, oh, what was the, the statistic given? It was that one pope killed more people than all people of World War I in, in a day, something to that point, as he sent out uh, the, the Inquisition to, to, you know, believe in this or die. You're this, and you die anyway. So here the call is to mix her judgment, double strength for the deeds that she had committed. Now look how Isaiah spoke of this future day, okay? This is how Isaiah spoke of it. He says, and this will be the most scriptures I've put on the board, guys, okay? Isaiah 47, 6 through 11, this is what he says. I was angry with my people. I, were profane, I profaned my heritage, and I gave them into your hand. Speaking of giving them into Babylon's hand, okay? Um, you did not show mercy to them. Babylon did not show mercy to them. On the aged, you made your yoke very heavy. Yet you said, I will be a queen forever. These things you did not consider, nor remember, remember outcome of them. Remember the outcome of them. Now then, hear this, you sensual one, who dwells securely, securely, who says in your head, I am and there is no one beside me. I will not sit as a widow, nor, nor no loss of children. That's the same thing that we read about earlier in Revelation. Isaiah 47, 9. But these two things will come on you suddenly in one day loss of children and widowhood they will come on you full a full measure um, in spite of your many sorceries in spite of the great power of your spells you felt secure in your wickedness and said no one sees me your wisdom and your knowledge they have dis deluded you for you have said in your heart, heart i am and there is no one beside me but evil will come on you which you will not know how to charm away the disaster will fall on you suddenly a disaster will fall on you, uh, which you cannot uh, atone, and destruction about which you do not know will come on you suddenly. So this isn't speaking of the fall of Babylon during the medo persian era. Again, I got to repeat that. It hasn't happened yet. <clears throat> and the kings of the earth will, who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her will weep and lament, and lament over her uh, when they see the smoke of her burning standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment saying whoa whoa the great city babylon the strong city for in one hour your judgment has come this uh this picture is a picture of hiroshima 76 years ago 76 years ago okay in a single moment this city was reduced to nothing it was reduced to nothing with one explosion it was reduced to nothing and i see that in some scenario amplified when god brings judgment not necessarily with the bomb but with his hand okay the scriptures seem to point to a twofold destruction babylon will first be attacked by god's consecrated ones he calls them my mighty warriors in isaiah 13 1 through 5. jeremiah says thus says the lord Behold, I'm going to arouse against Babylon and against the inhabitants of Lev Kamani, which is Babylon, Mesopotamia, the spirit destroyer. I will dispatch foreigners to Babylon that they may winnow her and may devastate her land, for on every side they will be opposed to her in the day of her calamity. Jeremiah names these foreigners as the kingdoms of Ararat, which is Turkey, uh, Mini, which is Armenia, Ashkenaz, which is southern Russia and Black Sea, and the Medes, the area between western and northern Iran. We read about that in Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51. This is what God calls his consecrated army, his mighty warriors. When the sixth bowl judgment is poured out, we're told that the Euphrates River was dried up. This provided a path for Antichrist and the kings and his alliance of kings to leave Babylon and to gather uh, in northern Israel, prepared to invade the city. Revelation 17 said that these 10 horns or kings would align themselves with Antichrist. And Revelation 17 says, for God has put it in their heads to execute this, his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. So it's sounds like he's given them this uh fulfilled and i don't know exactly what those words are but it means that he's doing it for a season and it seems that two of these kings and this is a question mark gary okay folks uh it seems that two of these kings will break off from the rest and go back and attack the city of babylon 
While Antichrist and his armies are away, these mighty warriors attack Babylon, which has been left unprotected, and these kings attempt to take over, destroying the Antichrist city while he's away. But it's God uh, that is using his army to accomplish his will. Now, following this man-made attack, <clears throat> the Lord will utterly destroy the physical city supernaturally, and that's what we read in Revelation 16, 17 to 21. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl against the, upon the air, and loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. And there were flashings of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake, such as there has not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake, and it was so mighty, the great city was split into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of wine of his fierce wrath. Remember the, the recompense? And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and the huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each, came down from heaven upon men, and uh, men blasphemed God because the plague of hail, because it's, the plague was extremely severe. 100 pound hailstones. And I was reading one commentator that says when they spoke about hailstones, they're talking about actually rocks coming out of, of. So if there was huge rocks, 100 pounds, and you could think about this. Earlier, we read that um, that the people of the earth, when they're feeling these different things, the sores and the, the water turning to blood, that they blaspheme God and they blaspheme the people. And what was the uh, the penalty for blaspheming? Being stoned to death. It's kind of interesting, you know. I'm not saying that's exactly what it was, but it seems the same thing happened in the book of Joshua when they were pursuing, um, I think it was the Malachites. I'm not absolutely sure on that. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and every kind of citron wood and every article of ivory and every article made from very costly wood and bronze and iron and marble and cinnamon and spice and incense and perfume and frankincense and wine and olive oil and fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep and cargoes of horses and chariots of slaves and human lives. The fruit you long for has gone from you and all things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you and men will no longer find them. Um, and you see just by the, the amount of different items that was being brought to, to Babylon, Babylon would have been like the distribution of these kind of things as other ships came in, it seems like. The scene shifts to those who had an interest in Babylon now for financial gain. Those who had used Babylon as kind of like a hub to peddle their, their wares were now left with the goods and no one to buy them. I find it interesting that human lives were part of the commodity listed. And we know that today when we read about different countries that sell children and women into slavery, right? And even men into slavery, but we read about in our times of sexual slavery, a lot of the things, you know? And keep in mind that it's quite possible that at this time, Babylon may have been the only major city left intact when this kind of business would take place. Because it kind of seems like God is focusing at the end times on the two different Babylon and Jerusalem, his city and the city of evil, you might say. And it's a final confrontation. It seems like he's purposely putting this in our minds. The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear and torment, weeping and mourning, saying, woe, woe, the great city. She who was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour, such great wealth has been laid waste and every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as make their living by the sea stood at a distance. They're watching this and they're just seeing it, it, it destroyed. And they're just, they're un, it's unbelievable that this has happened. It couldn't have happened, you know? This is the greatest place around. And again, we see this terminology for in one hour, such great wealth has been laid waste. Man has a, a man has a, a way of believing that he can get what he wants and protect himself when he has the right amount of money, right? If you've got the wealth, you can take care of yourself. I, I really, I, you know, Christians wouldn't say this, but in their mind sometimes they think, it, I can take care of it myself, you know? Non-Christians will definitely, you know, I got enough, I'll take this and this, I'll buy stocks, I'll have guns, I'll, you know, whatever, you know? Um, but such was a city of Babylon, uh, 
such was the city of Babylon and those who did business with her. It had everything, luxury, goods, and wealth, and it was all gone in an hour. It was like the things that they had confidence in were gone. What is your confidence in? Your confidence in the Lord. He's not going to be gone ever, you know. But they had it in material things and it was gone. And they see how empty they are when this happens. And it says in every, uh, excuse me, Revelations 18, 18 to 20. And were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out weeping and mourning saying whoa whoa the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth for in one hour she has been laid waste rejoice over her O heaven and you saints and apostles and prophets because god has pronounced judgment for you against her so you see every shipmaster and every passenger sailor and as many who made their living by her by the sea they stood at a distance and they're crying when they see the smoke coming up from the city the mourning is reflected in uh, that people threw dust on their heads and were crying in mourning. That's the sign of mourning. Uh, and for the third time, it's mentioned that this all took place in an hour, showing how fast it happened. I think it purposely, I don't know, I, you know, I showed that picture of Hiroshima when it's gone. I think it purposely would have taken longer because you had to absorb what was going on here, you know, and people were adding their boats out there looking at it. It's my thoughts. The magnificence and splendor of the city is gone. And back in chapter 6, John records the words of the martyrs in heaven. Revelation 6, 9, when the Lamb broke the fifth seal, John says, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? How long is it going to be? And at that time, they were told that they should rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. So God tells them, I'm going to judge them, but you have to hold on a little bit. Now the time has come for them to cry out no more as their question is answered. And the call is for heaven and for the saints and apostles to rejoice in heaven because God has pronounced judgment for you against them. So that's what he said in this verse. I'm pronouncing judgment for you against them. So they're answered. And if you can imagine, so in this picture again, if you can imagine that Babylon will be rebuilt in such a manner that would probably surpass ancient Babylon. And I, I say that based on the, er, uh, the technology and based on the arrogance of the Antichrist. He's above all, you know, and so he'd want to be, I would think, greater but if if you can imagine that the babylon that time will surpass ancient babylon then you can imagine the shock and horror of those who depended on her for their livelihood see that this 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 uh this moat goes all the way around the city and uh and is connected to the euphrates so you you can see these from a distance and there's a very interesting passage that jeremiah wrote when jerusalem was conquered by babylon in 586 bc it's a very interesting passage and as soon as you finish reading this scroll, you will be, tie a stone to it and throw it into the middle of the Euphrates. Just so shall Babylon sink down and rise again because of the calamity I'm going to bring upon her and they will become exhausted. Thus are the words of Jeremiah. So the prophet Jeremiah, the city's falling to Babylon and they're going to be carried off. And he gives, he's given an assignment by the Lord. He was given a message for Sariah to carry and deliver to Babylon along with the captives. So this guy's carrying the message of God to Babylon. Um, the message is in condensed form is, Behold, the days are coming, declared the Lord, when I will punish your idols. For the Lord is going to destroy Babylon, and he will make her a loud noise, make her loud noise vanish from her. For the destroyer is coming against her, against Babylon. The broad wall of Babylon will be completely raised and her high gates will be set on fire. So the people will be toiling for nothing and the nations become exhausted only for fire. Um, Jeremiah commands Sarah, Sarah to carry, carry this written prophecy against Babylon into captivity. After he reads it, he's to tie it to a stone and throw it in the middle of the Euphrates River. So this message will sink just as Babylon's going to sink in the future. It's a word picture. Okay, it's kind of like what Ezekiel did, but this, this is in the book of Jeremiah. It's a picture of the doom of Babylon. And now in our Revelation passage, which says, 
Then a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. So what was predicted in, in Jeremiah's day, which did not happen to Babylon, her walls remained as the Medes and Persians came in. Alexander came back into, into uh, Babylon. In fact, it was his intent to rebuild it and make it his capital city, but he died. Um, so the, the walls were still intact. So this is definitely future. The strong angel proclaims the same thing. Babylon, the great city, will be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. These pictures paint a picture of permanent judgment and destruction. That's not like we've seen before. And the sound of harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeters will not be heard in you any longer. And no craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer. And the sound of a mill will not be heard in you any longer. And the light of the lamp will not shine its in you any longer. And the voice of the bridegroom and bride will not be heard in you any longer. For your merchants, were the great men of the earth, because all nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and all who have been slain on the earth. The Lord said the same kind of thing uh, when he was speaking to the city of Tyre in Ezekiel. He said, so I will silence the sound of your songs and the sound of your harps will be heard no more. He was saying, you're so arrogant, you think everything, I'm going to silence what you consider joy. Isaiah speaks about the earth the same way. He says, the new wine mourns, the vine decays, all merry-hearted sigh. The gaiety of tambourine ceases. The noise of revelers stop. The gaiety of the harp ceases. Then in our passage, it says that you're not going to hear. You, you can always imagine if a city that was that large, as you're getting close to the gates, you're going to hear noise all over the place. It's going to be silent. A silence that would just like cut, cut through the air. And the craftsman and his craft will be no more heard in the city of Babylon. In other words, the, the sound of manufacturing and mills, they're not going to hear those. All that was the glory of Babylon will be seen no more as their light is ex extinguished. There will be no more sound of the joy of those being married, nor the sounds of the merchants. All of the common things, you know, will, will be gone. The sound of his former activities, whether music, manufacturing, or milling, will be silenced forever. And that's all that's left is the sound of silence because they were deceived by Babylonian, by the Babylon sorcery. She was guilty of the blood of the saints, of, of all believers who were slain for their faith. And now as God is rewarding her in full measure. In Revelation 6, 9, again, it says, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And I heard an angel of the water saying, in Revelation 16, it says, I heard the angel of the water saying, Righteous are you who are and who were, O Holy One, because you judge these things. For they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. Revelation 17, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. Um, and, and the thing about this is God saw it when it was happening um, uh, back in, in Isaiah's day, okay? Uh, he, he saw it when it was happening in Jerusalem, he saw it all the way through. He always saw the blood of the saints dying. It's not like he bypassed it, but he was waiting for that day. And in, um, and in two weeks, we're going to read this verse. He has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged, avenged the blood of his bond servants on her. So when this happens, he's avenging the blood of all those people. And when, when Jesus returns, he's, he'll exercise another role of the kinsman redeemer. He, re, he redeemed us from sin. He's going to redeem the land. And his other, his other purpose, one of the things he is the avenger of blood. Those who had murdered one, he would go over and take care of. It. And that's what he does in this role. So once again, this, this picture one more time, and as you see the, the army base, the events of Revelation 17, 1 through 18 will be filled at, fulfilled at the midpoint of the seven years. And again, you're responsible to check this out for yourself, okay? Whereas the events of Revelations 18, 124 will occur towards the end of the seven years, immediately before the second coming of Christ. The destruction of the city of Babylon is the final blow to the times of the Gentiles. 
in the last statue we saw. The time of Gentiles will be there until they are no more. And then Christ will come. And you remember in, in this picture we had, oh, sorry, that's the next picture. <laughs> the, the times of the Gentile be, Gentiles began in 605 BC. Okay, we, we read about the, the head of gold, the, the arms and chest of silver, the, uh, the uh, girth of, of bronze and the legs of, of Rome. And it talked about these things being Babylon, this represented Babylon, the empire that would come late next with the Medo-Persians, then the Greek empire, and then Rome in two key forms. And the last time that she comes, she's going to be destroyed by a, a stone that comes from heaven, not formed by human heads, and it will absolutely vaporize this statue. And out of that stone will require will come a mountain that will reign forever. So this is Christ coming back. Now, in two weeks, we're going to study about the return of Christ at his second coming. It'll bring forth the kingdom of Messiah and the end of the age of the Gentiles, as prophesied by in Daniel 2. So I want you to read ahead in chapter 19. There's a lot in there. Uh, one of the things that you might look at is we always kind of see that Jesus comes back and he stands on the Mount of Olives. That's the first place. That's not the first place he returns. Okay, but he will be up there. That's not the first place that he, he stands on. He goes to Basra first. So anyway, I want you to read ahead on that. And uh, any questions or comments or a lot, huh? <laughs> you know, when they get into all these different kings moving in on different areas, kings from the north and south, Daniel 10 talks about, um, you, you kind of wonder who these guys are, but understand this. Okay, the Antichrist has all these kings behind him, right? But the world that they're living in is filled with deception. There's really no true loyalty. He was strong, so they're following him, but there's no true loyalty. So you can almost see if there's an opportunity for you to get ahead and break off, you're going to do that, you know? And so you can kind of understand that if you were around people that were always deceptive, are you ever going to really trust them? You might go along in something that you think, but you're always going to be watching out because they're liable to, to mess with you, right? So I think that's what the days are like in, in these coming days. So anyway, there you have it. Okay, uh, Lord, I want to thank you for um, uh, this, this book that's uh, um, hard to get at one reading, Lord. And um, my hope that you'll reveal more and more to me as the years go by. And uh, so each uh, time I read this book, Lord, there'll be more of that piece together. But until then, Lord, I thank you for what you're showing me now. I thank you for what I'm able to bring to the class. And I pray that you would help them to um, uh, not be afraid of reading Revelation. Um, that maybe just a few things stand out to them when they're reading it. And they understand a little bit more, Lord. And I, and I know your spirit will teach us as we do this. Help us to stay faithful in your word, Lord, and help us not just read it, but to live it. We pray these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Gavin's going to be here next week, and then the week after that, because I'm, I'm going down the beach. I just don't want to have to worry about reading about that stuff, you know, even though I've read ahead. But no, no, uh, Gavin's going to teach something. I told him to, to teach something that he would, you know, feel comfortable with. So, um Stop share. Face goes. Okay, I think. What's that? You are excused. Yes, and uh, it's almost ten thirty. So you have time to. You ought to see the, the beard on that dog. It's looking really glorious, you know? Yeah. It's, 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 it's,